how are you bitches doing on this episode of my podcast my guest is philip lee diab phil is a film and media studies major at columbia university he was the special forces cameraman in afghanistan for about 6 years and in this episode i get down with phil to talk about his exploits in the military his his time at the job that he was doing his endeavors in art his experiments with poetry growing up in ohio being a football player although i just do not have taste for american football um the third voice on this podcast is going to be peri sidhu peri is a dear friend i have an episode recorded with him that i'm going to release soon to peri help me um interview phil cuz phil is a beast of a person to interview to be very honest he is he is so cryptic with his poetry it takes me a second to untangle let's get into it let's let's have you see what you think about phil once he's delivered his story wait i'm here with phil diab phil diab is probably the the one person i've known all my time here at columbia i think yeah. we met orientation or something dude yeah, cool. yeah i don't even remember that at this point it's been just too far and just to mention my dear friend purveer is also sitting peri actually my bad you know what yeah. podcast world peri um peri is also sitting in with this um feel free to contribute okay. phil is was a combat cameraman for 6 years right after high school he was working with the special forces in the american military and then he matriculated in some sense or translated his cameraman abilities to pursue a degree in film and media studies here at columbia that's correct did i get that right phil yeah yeah and uh, i guess in an informal sense i i fell ass backwards into the one thing that i was meant to do for the rest of my life which was uh it was I I just want you to be a little louder for the mic to get you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh it was filmmaking. I uh I first entered the uh the military. I had I had a for the mic to get you, you have to be a little louder. A little louder. Yep, okay. absolutely. Project it. I can I can I can put I can move the volume down afterwards, but moving it up cracks the yeah, fucking yeah, voice. Yeah, so, I, yeah. Okay. Feel a little uncomfortable, I don't care. Yeah. Go no, ahead. I'm good. I'm just getting settled in. Right. Yeah. So you were saying the yeah. one thing that you you were born to do Yeah, I fell ass backwards into the one thing I was meant to do for the rest of my life. Uh-huh. It was uh it was an interesting start. I got this job by chance. Uh I knew it was a it was a rare slot going in and uh by the time I entered advanced individual training, it was uh it was just apparent to me that I had a love for telling the stories of other people uh specifically people that couldn't tell the stories for themselves so uh in a sense uh my job as a combat cameraman was to you know go in bed with these um these units and mm-hmm. document the validity of war in a sense. Wow. Dude, I've always been a fan of how you put together words to communicate meaning and I we've gone over that conversation several times, but it's it's this weird poeticness that sort of sneaks itself in when you speak and I'm always a fan. It's like it takes me more time to figure out what you mean than yeah. it takes for me to figure out something like I don't know Kierkegaard or something I don't it just is 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 just a, and it's usually happy Kierkegaard is sad as fuck so like he's credit a, to you he's a poet he is it's kind of similar to you because the way I I used to tell this to Brucker all the time I'm like dude um you try to tell me your ideas all the time right he does nothing but try to explain what he's trying to say yeah but when he shows me his poems for some reason I get what he's saying yeah, far I more what you said just now is like a factual statement but then you're like documenting the validity of war. Right. What a sentence, man. What a sentence. <laughs> Expand on that. What does that mean, dude? Uh that that that's just trying to connote, I guess, the a few different experiences that that help understand uh what it was to do that job. Uh their job. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, to you know i was i was telling the story of i guess i would put it like my job wasn't to be the hero it was to tell the hero's story so wow. it was painting a picture really my most imperative um objective like on target was painting a picture for battlefield commanders that couldn't be on the ground with the the, the troops so 
I I was there, you know, you know, we're we're, we're kind of I don't know, I guess the, the the term is like being the eyes and the ears of you know, the battlefield. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, it's very raw. Right. You know, it's it's not something a lot of people uh, ever get like a a, a window or right. look into. But um, did you ever feel like it was your your brothers that you were sharing the story of? Like how yeah. how close were you with like whatever um, squad you were with? Because I'm also imagining you were with different squads at different times. Yeah, yeah. Certain you know certain platoons would rotate in and out. I would you know I worked with three different uh, Ranger battalions, all three of them actually. And uh, at first it's funny because. Um, you know, you're looked you're looked at as an outsider. Like mm-hmm. you're not who you are to them when you show up. You know, you, I wasn't Private First Class Philip Dia. Mm-hmm. You know, that wasn't my identity to them. My identity to them was the last combat cameraman they had. And if he was a piece of shit, then you know that's what they saw in you until you prove them otherwise. Right. So you really have to earn your stripes with these guys um, uh-huh. or else it's going to be hell right and if you're bad enough at it you'll get fired and sent back to you know like Bagram uh-huh. mm-hmm. you know everything that you just said just made me wonder what the title of your autobiography would be would it be something to the effect of the storytelling of Battlefield or the Battlefield of Storytelling <laughs> or would it be something to the effect of um, the curse of rotational identity I don't know because because <laughs> there is just there is just so many themes that I can pull apart from that That's interesting. but I have a bunch of questions prepared for you sure. right um, Phil I've found that you're an athletic athletic dude I have played sports and I have seen your enthusiasm <laughs> sorry Perry just <laughs> just shot, ignore me <laughs> shot ashes up into the air they ignore me <laughs> In celebration of my athleticism. You know what? I think I think the camera camera oh, oh, the camera the, the microphone can hear you guys, right? As you exhale the smoke out. For reference, it's perfect. It's perfect. I sounded like Little Wayne at the beginning of it, like you Weezy heard, baby. You ever hear the, the lighter <laughs> hey, flick? Hey, can, can I give Phil's introduction? By the way, uh-huh. um, so Phil is not only fantastic of whatever Brucker is about to talk about him with, but. Um, Phil has a fucking arm, man. This guy <laughs> can throw that football a mile on a dime. And man. effortlessly at that, too. I've yeah. seen him do that. Yeah, it yeah. takes all the strength that my rotator cuff can manage to throw the ball, like, halfway the extent to which you can do it when you just breathe or something. I don't know, dude. There's a gorilla behind it with all this rotational force. Right. It just hucks that ball into your chest. You can tell football, American football is an American sport just by just by comparing how, like, somebody else or, like, like even when I see Damien throw the ball, I'm like, okay, yeah, man. Because he could shoot Morgan down from a distance he'd be like Morgan Darn. this is special operation <laughs> on, a, on a dime <laughs> on a, like a prep far right. right so dude you've played sports and I've seen your enthusiasm towards them I've, I've heard stories about your enthusiasm for sports too what do you get out of sports what what did you learn what is in what is it what is there for me in sports for for me it, it's the, the sense of play uh, I think it's like the purest uh, landscape of like discovery for anybody trying to reconcile like the day-to-day things i think sports is sort of like an arena a, a place where we escape either as performers or spectators so uh for me it was just it, it was always like just a place where i could discover more about myself so whether it was playing football or like wrestling mm-hmm. and wrestling was like a big um was like a, you know just it was sort of like a light bulb for me as a right. young man uh, but even though these things are tough and challenging it's um, it is that sense of play that allows you to sort of reconcile who you're becoming with like the child that you have but didn't yeah like, right. the, the, chi- like, the child at heart right you know that rings such a bell with me I've never been a runner I've, I've never really uh, put myself on track but I've been running off late and I find this this very weird progression that I sort of don't even notice until it's occurred. And the way it'll be is that I'd be running and I just want to give up, right? It'd be like, stop, you've ran enough, right? Yeah. But then I find it easier every time I say no to it 
to say no to it the next time yeah, right like wow. and like and wow. in that process there is so much self discovery i realize how quick i would be to give up mm. right and i realize how much distance i have to go in terms of not giving up in terms of because my body is not tired as such it's my mind that's yeah. getting tired mm. and then there's going to be a phase where my body gets tired and then the mind will have to push it you know like this it is it is a, it's a very accurate description it's it's a, it's a process of self learning self realization yeah. to some degree yeah. right i think that could be said about so many things in life uh like so many things in life take that endurance like different and like element but similar in principle like we have to break down those walls and those barriers that we almost <clears throat> unconsciously set for ourselves mm-hmm. so like you're running and you're running and you're running and then like out of nowhere like the unconscious hits you and says you should stop and then if you're smart you take a deep breath inhale inspiration exhale mm-hmm. tension and mm-hmm. then you understand that the conscious can overcome that and you can keep running if right you want to. right I run till i fall that's what i tell myself <laughs> yeah. i'm going to either twist my ankle or fall i i i always i always see that as like a proverb like i want to arrive at the finish line of life exhausted like just fucking like gave it everything that i had up until that point like i don't want to arrive at the finish line of life with loads of energy mm. left over that'd be such a waste You know, such a waste. It's interesting hearing it from another athlete, right? Because there's such a like a very intimate bond that men have with sports. Mm-hmm. And it's it's like one I think it's integral in, integral to developing our character. Yeah. Right? So you're constantly confronted with the most difficult th- thing that you can come to, which is your mortality, right? Mm-hmm. Something falling apart. And when you're confronted with that enough, um you develop this like callous <laughs> right where you can yeah. like, I can truck through one more step yeah. right mm-hmm. i can do it's just one voice because like you're not actually telling yourself hey uh complete this and stick to my goal and i had a plan and don't fail here right it's mm-hmm. not like this long-winded conversation yeah, right. it's a statement mm-hmm. right uh, not now mm-hmm. right the next step that's all you can going. manage between breaths too cuz so i can set out from this apartment thinking not stopping before my goals done but when you're running when you're out of breath when you're breathing so intensely you can barely manage a sentence even in your head even though you're not using your vocal cords and yes. what not it's like not now or keep going or something like that right you cannot rationalize yeah. there is no rationality in in action as such right that life is breath is the physical representation of consciousness is going to the most important thing to you at that point which is sustaining your physical be, being at like with you know while you're running right because you're pushing yourself the only thing that matters is life uh-huh. everything else fades mm-hmm. away because really in in the scheme of it, it doesn't matter right can i ask you um how, what did you find with football specifically running is a it's an interesting example because it's one act it's an isolated right? act too but to now, some degree but football is a complicated game yeah. it's, it's, it's a, a game of chess but there's it's so complex that um it's difficult for people to understand that don't play it so like this this philosophy that you found that you attached to running like what did you find in football oh man uh so you know a lot of different things during a lot of different points uh growing up playing you know i played from like 7th grade to um my my senior year I actually didn't play my sophomore and junior year but when i arrived back in ohio uh i showed up and uh the next year my senior year i was I was eligible to play. And the coaches knew me from wrestling, some of them. Um, oh, they picked the wrestler, that's why. They they, they, they knew, picked the tough guy. Yeah. They knew I was dumb and they knew I was tough, right? So this was the thing. <laughs> dense, like, dense was, and tough, right? My, 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 my coach, one of my coaches always used to call me a broad shouldered pussy. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but this was this was like this was the this was the bit. Like it was it was crazy because um, you know, I showed up into a system where guys were, you know, in it for four years. Like so I was competing with um you know guys that had been pretty much bred to play the position that they were they were, you know, playing. playing. Yeah. And so I, you know, I went into the season as like a fullback uh through camp and then I got into two days and it was like the, the second or third day we had just got our helmets on, right? We're warming up. My coach comes up to me. He goes, "I think I have an opportunity for you." And I looked at him like, "Okay, like you you're going to move me to like another skill position, right? <laughs> and he goes, uh, I want you to play right guard. Mm. Which is which is on the line. Uh-huh. 
It's humbling you. I'm 165 pounds. I've never played on the line. Uh-huh. I played wide receiver. I've been a running back. And, right. You know, at that point in my life, I was like, you know, uh, you know, stout, but I was still, you know, like I said, I was dumb and I was tough. So, um, I just, you know, I took a deep breath. I remember very vividly, smelled the fresh cut grass, <laughs> and I said, "All right." And then I ran down to the other side of the field where the linemen were warming up and like going through the sleds and it was just miserable. This is where I go to die. I <laughs> literally, it was like, it's it was the like, trenches. it was Dante's eight survival. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what the poor piece sneaks in segment. That is no avoiding that with you, dude. And, and like, it was, oh gosh, it was like so funny. I, I was just, I remember like so many emotions were just like all feeding into like the adrenaline. And then I just, I fucking felt bad for myself for like, two and a half seconds and I just felt disgusted because I was like I just couldn't bring myself to spend any more time dwelling on the fact that I had just been like seriously fucking ego checked like mm-hmm. you know like mm-hmm. but they knew that I could play somewhere they just you know didn't have they they didn't want to me to just sit behind somebody right the entire year so uh I ended up starting at right guard and I was the smallest starting offensive lineman in like Ohio division football and it was just um humbling I mean, it, it yeah well it just it, it puts like a like a uh not like a mean streak but it just like having to 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 to, to learn this this new this new role and and being you know typically outweighed 50 to 75 pounds by everybody it just you face like you know Perry said like you face facing that adversity is where you learn about yourself right like you don't learn anything like laying on the couch comfortable right right I wouldn't have learned anything backing up somebody on the like a position sitting on the bench but you know uh accepting that uh role that was presented in my way and and taking it and and mastering it in a way and facing these challenges you know that's that's right. what football right yeah. And how does this how does this translate into the into the military? Is is the joy or the complication of being in the military similar to that of being in a sports team? Can I add to that, dude? Um, it's like what you said earlier. You have to earn your stripes. Yeah. Right. You're yeah. really earning your stripes. Yeah, it was the same thing earlier in life. Yeah. So for reference, like a guard is um he's a he's a big guy, he's stocky, but he's quick. He's quick mm-hmm. with his feet. Right, but he's a tactical position. Yeah. The tackles on the end are like the big meaty guys. We ran a wing T too, where like the guard that's so constantly moving. Right, mm-hmm. so and then the people that you're taking out are these massive gorilla men that are like middle linebackers and defensive ends. Right, so you're just like hitting a wall every time you go. Mm-hmm. But your team recognizes that, mm-hmm. right? Which I also think is interesting because in the military, like you said earlier, you have to earn your position with this these people. True. Right. These are people that are committing. Combat, like they're fighting. True. Right? Yeah. So because they're fighting, um, you don't just get handed anything. No. You have to earn a you place. Have, yeah, yeah. And you have to play that role and like and be that, you know, subject matter as expert, whatever whatever it is, whatever you're calling on. Mm-hmm. It is. It's really like I think the best things in life are the meritocracy. So, you know what I'm saying? Like where you like where you're um, were you able to distinguish yourself by your merit? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. what will you bring to, mm-hmm. to the oh, collective of others, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. And so how, how, does, how, how exactly does the experience of being in a sports team, like what are the parallels that you found uh, from the time that you were playing sports and the time that you were in military? Is it is it similar? Is the brotherhood similar? It, or is the, is the joy that comes with being a part of something as grand as that and just losing your sense of selfishness individuality do all of these things come together yeah yeah like the playing sports definitely prepared me to to exist in like the military environment um you know it it was just on a larger scale like the army is just like the biggest gang in the world Mm -hmm. um see that's also poetic man it's so annoying (laughs) also the (laughs) art military is just a huge social experiment like (laughs) <laughs> if you, think about it, you take you take men and women from all different parts of the country and you bring them together to train them to kill and be killed for each other, and you you get a certain type of microcosm, mm. and that's like the the, the 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 brotherhood 
that you know, aspect that you you get of it like uh, is unforgettable. People tell me you never. Yeah, it's a feeling, man. Right. It's, it's like, like something you just never get over, or at least not in the first few years of leaving the military. Yeah, everybody has a different experience with it. Right. Um, there's, you know, some that I carry with me more than others. Um, nostalgia is a finicky son of a bitch. Right. Um, I'm, you know, a firm believer in that. But, you know, I mean, we all romanticize the past in different ways. Um, and I just find... I find like the, the experiences that stand out the most to me are are those those ones of human connection uh, uh -huh. in the mesh of all of the, the external bullshit that's going on and everything that you're like being put through um, you're like in the suck together but because you're going through it together um, it binds you, binds you it makes you into one yeah. in some sense Leaves. right and this is me just drawing from the limited ex experience I have playing soccer at a club at a, with a team with a family uh, yeah. back in the day. These things translate, man. Like sports are just civilian substitutions for war. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Wow. That's yeah. that's that's that trumps Rupert Sheldrake's quote: "Being sports are the yoga of the West." I think yours is is far better. I, I mean, yeah. You know what? I think the West made it such. Mm -hmm. Right. We we took the combative element. And then glorified that. Mm -hmm. The East took the movement element and mm -hmm. glorified that. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Interesting. How long? How long were you in the uniform? And and like, like you mentioned, your your role was telling the stories of war in some sense. What what exactly goes into that? Uh, so I was I was in uniform for for six years. I was in the service for six years, um, and question was what, is, what went into telling. yeah like what what exactly is the job of a combat cameraman like what does a day in a combat cameraman's life look like in combat no uh, maybe yeah well, whatever's more interesting I would say. <laughs> that's where the story is right right yeah whatever's yep. more romanticized yeah. by your nostalgia <laughs> so many different versions of mm. so many different things um it's, it's painting the picture man um I came into the special operations community at the right time. Uh, it was like around 2000, late 2012, 2013. And, you know, prior to that, combat cameramen weren't getting many photos released th through the, the mission that we did because of the nature of its, you know, secrecy. Um, but, you know, like just time, everything changes and things became more loose and being able to get released so uh, primarily it was it was it was to document the, the, the crime scene man like you know we were going after known terrorist threats and we're not going after just like dirt farmers like we're you know we're going after like commanders sub commanders uh, big drug facilitators and um, once we get there uh, and the assault team you know does what the assault team does uh, there's an aftermath that has to be documented uh, to incriminate you know um, or you know justify whatever the assault team did to some degree yeah, yeah, right whatever. the action right like yeah. you said val validate the war mm -hmm. in some sense yeah yeah it's it's gosh there's so many like mission statements that we used to like, I used to like memorize like, <laughs> that, that it's just like they've, 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 they've left me now uh, but it's like you know to provide high definition visual imagery for battlefield commanders uh, for, you know, for critical decision making. Mm -hmm. um, it's putting bad guys. We've been in the same in the same breath. Like during the mission, I always found a way to incorporate art through like long exposure photography. Mm -hmm. So we only went out you know operating during the the nighttime. The nighttime. So, uh, what was big was uh, what we could do artistically, and you know, I did certainly take a, you know, a, a lot of night vision video, but I did both. I was just like, I was uh, very active during the mission, and I was always trying to capture these long exposure images of like rangers taking me and like, um, or like shooting. But uh, it was it was that that element that kept it like innocent for me in a way mm -hmm. you know like mm -hmm. there was a lot of bad shit that, that came along like a lot of things that I 
I like saw and had to deal with it. I never thought I would have to see you do right. it or smell. <laughs> are, are you just so that I I understand what you said was correct? Were you trying to negate the the downside, the the dirt that war brings as an inevitable consequence through the artistic means of your expression? Was is that it? When you mean when you say that you, you know I was trying to keep myself innocent by by sneaking in art and some to some degree. Well, yeah, that's that's I I think it was more it was a more natural it was a result of more natural circumstance. Um, right. It's who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah. Clearly, yes. And I knew there was an opportunity to to bring art into something that at the time I didn't see as like because it was just you know I was nineteen I was like this was my job like. Mm-hmm. I knew, like, to some, you know, extent, like, it was definitely special, but, like, looking back is where I found the perspective that, um, how unique it was to blend those two realities of art and war, Uh and it's just, I mean, dude, there's things that just, like, rip, ripple, like, and reverberate from that, um, Uh that experience in terms of knowledge, like, as an artist, I, you know, I was just always using what was around me to make the, the most beautiful thing that I could, uh, where things aren't typically supposed to be beautiful. Mm-hmm. So whether that was like a rock that I was using to hold up my camera in a certain way to capture the moonlight coming in and silhouetting rangers against the poppy field. Right. You know. Right. So you were posted in Afghanistan, then I'm assuming if there's all this drug and poppy involved, right? Yeah. I know my drugs. Can I, can I ask you if you were, um, were you trying to, what lens were you trying to paint it with, right? Because if a cameraman goes in and he's an objective cameraman, right? You guys can look my stuff up online if you want. Oh, your pictures? Yeah. Dude, I've never seen them. I would love to. Yeah. How, what do I Google? What are the keywords people should be using? There's a, there's an online media hub. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's called it's like D V I D S dot com. It's like the vet defense visual imagery system database, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where you can find like my published photos from Afghanistan. That you know what I think? Uh, just like how you go to our uh, colloquia page mm-hmm. and you see all of Phil's photos and they have the same lens. Mm-hmm. I bet we could just go through that blind with no information. And that is that's Phil's picture. That, that's <laughs> Phil's, yeah, no, that's I can, Phil's picture. I can tell. I can, <laughs> Phil is fond of angles if you haven't noticed. Phil will oh, take just sure, like the man. most absurd angle that he can imagine and make it into a live photography. I've never seen so much color. <laughs> no, 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 for sure. I've never seen... Uh, I appreciate it. I think I understand art truly but from a distance but truly still by hanging out with you in some in some weird sense if that makes sense. So, oh, so you're... Uh, my question was uh, there's an objective way that you can take a picture right, right. or try to and I think um, what you said earlier was pretty spot on right that your natural flavor bleeds into it it's inevitable it should, and yeah. if you're ta- if you're doing something creative then maybe you can't help that from occurring but um, at the end of the day it's a it's a it's a gruesome scene right and it's very dark sometimes mm-hmm. um, most times all the time, <laughs> all the time. Wow. Like, well, well literally speaking all the time just because we, we operate at night yeah. Right, but yeah, oh. <laughs> it's dark. That's a dad joke, man. <laughs> I liked it. Right. Um, so, what is the lens that you uh, like? Your natural, I guess, not bias. What's but your, your filter? Inclination yeah. What's your filter? If if Phil was a filter on Instagram, what would that look like? Poetry, man. Like it's that's the only thing that makes sense to when I when I interpret the the your beautiful words through the neuro connections in my brain like the only thing that I can uh, respond with is poetry man like I just try to bring poet I try to make something that is just one way mean more than it, it is in its simplicity so you add rhythm and patterns yeah, to it yeah man. Uh. It's, it's 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 all a feeling it's all like it's all motion everything in life is uh. constantly going it's all impermanent right and can I ask you um can I, uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, um, please. When did this happen for you? Hmm. Right? Because that's an, it's an interesting person to turn out to be. Right? right? From that brawny dude or like that stocky dude or like that that, 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 that that dude who had that ego check on that field to becoming this 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 sportic this this sport who would who would speak through photographs of gruesome scenes. Like wh- where was the pivot? When did that happen to you? Gosh man. Um, Cause okay, just real quick, you have lived the life of a meathead. 
right? There's a there's oh, a what? a meathead. A meathead. No. The stereotype. I would I wouldn't say wrestling, football, military. Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess. You should <laughs> I wouldn't say that, but yeah. yes, that's you know fair. what? That's kind of that's kind of sad. Um, but what I'm saying is like, so a lot of my friends followed this path, right? And they all ended up in like a specific frame, right? Mm-hmm. But the poet is something that's foreign to me. Right, where it's almost like it's stolen. You like you stole it from. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't mean that. I don't mean that uh, uh, in, in 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 any other sense. But the fact that you sort of like you sort of dove into the lake of art, and then you you extracted the port for yourself, and you decided to carry it with you no matter where you were, be that Afghanistan or be that mm-hmm. Colombia or be that the football field when you're playing with us. There is. So w- where is that coming from? Is that is that yeah, the sense of your exactly question? Yeah. Yep. I I would have to say childhood man. I had a very 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 unique childhood uh-huh. uh, you know my parents divorced when I was like four so I, I moved around a lot um, and I just I think I I went through a lot of things that young kids don't usually go through so uh, but I never but my, my, my parents were very you know loving you know for all their you know, flaws. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it made me understand that things get better no matter what happens. So going through these things like early in life, like as bad as they may seem out of context or as bad as they may have seen if I wasn't an undergraduate at Columbia right now, because mm-hmm. I, you know, there were certainly enough reasons for my story to, to turn out vastly different many points um but it just made me and you know because there was you know just that love uh it made me you know sort of i think just transform me into a, a very old soul early in life mm-hmm. you know what i think it is though and tell me if i'm wrong it almost seems like there is this unique blend which somebody could just m- miss uh, miss term or miss miss uh, or, or or use like a very reductive term called positivity. Uh, there is this there is the sense of gratitude. There is the filter at which you even look. It's not an inevitable consequence of having a childhood like that to becoming Philip Diab as he is right now. It was also the lens that you either consciously or either by, by by as a factor of being influenced in some sense decided to look at things where gratitude bled in and where where, where joy for life bled in because mm-hmm. that's that's a consistent theme in Phil as long as I've known him Thank you. and I might have known you for too little I have another question based on that sure. so it can come from two directions right either <clears throat> you created a lens right which is like cognitive in some way mm-hmm. where you now choose to see the world this way right or what it sounds like to me, and I think it's something that I've been noticing quite a bit, but like now I have the language for it, is that you have a well of love in you, mm. right? There's like a well in you. And yeah, it seems like sure. it's just, it's really large. He's like, that's my trouble, man. Yeah. That's my one problem is the I, fact that I have a well of love. I love the ladies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The well of ladies. Hey, you know what? I, I Credit is due when it's deserved, huh? When you put it like that, I definitely feel that I have and maybe slightly abnormal capacity to feel things um, that other people just may not feel and um, it is that well of love man it's just that's that's all I ever had as a, as a kid you know like really that's all we had as a family mm-hmm. we had the most important thing so we didn't have the material things that the comforts that you know um, most uh, you know people will have in America growing up because when you live in poverty, you just don't have certain comforts. But mm-hmm. we had the most important thing, and it was that love. And that, that definitely nurtured my understanding of it to, to be able to, to you know, reciprocate, uh, reciprocate that back into the world, or mm-hmm. to, to put that back into the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, You're very right. Um, I think the well of love analogy is, is very accurate because I've always, I've always had the sense of pride maybe pride is not the best word but i've always had a sense of pride in in my in my nature that elicits giving as a primary value i am i've always been fond of giving yeah but and i and i found myself doing that often enough and i've and i've loved that sensation but with you i've only ever received except for when you've asked me for either a nicotine fix or a thc fix that's the only time i've ever given you something apart from that when we meet it's just always you dumping this 
this load of love that you've been storing in your rectum for the last 20 minutes <laughs> or something that you'll just fart out or shit out on me and I'm just like, okay, wow, wow, wait, oh, I don't want to go to my class any longer. The sun's beautiful enough and I'm going to sit outside and have fun, like that kind of thing. He does it like the Buddha, right? So like, it's beautiful, it's a beautiful compliment. It, I mean, it's the way I see it. So I'm not, uh, I'm not here to compliment you. I will shit on you for sure. But, <laughs> but dude, so um, I see it as the Buddha, right? So you, the way you give love, because I was just thinking about like, okay, if there is this well in you, right? How is it dispersed? Mm -hmm. And you give love in moment to moment interactions yeah. unanimously, mm -hmm. right? Every interaction. I've not seen an interaction where that has not occurred, <laughs> right? So you like, it, it, it like almost spills over onto the person you're communicating with. Yeah. It's an interesting way to affect the world. Like one way, like at least we commonly tell ourselves that the way to make a difference is from a distance, right? I will mm -hmm. develop wealth, cultivate wealth so that I can give it out when necessary, mm -hmm. right? And then there's an abstraction that occurs. Sure. But in our moment to moment life, we suffer, yeah. right? But what you do is like every time you meet somebody, you leave them better than th when they arrive. That's, yeah, that's what, I, that's what I try to do, man. That's, that's. Is it a, is a, is it a feeling, feeling? Does that, does that, make you feel like you're complete is that the secret hack to life that everybody desires you know I man I I just don't know how to be any other way mm -hmm. I think I, I think there's many Buddha god damn it man he's it's all <laughs> no. I see. sorry sorry continue I see the halo I see the halo uh, emerging behind you yeah, the halo that my head won't fit through this door hey maybe you should be wearing you this. need to put on weight my friend <laughs> <laughs> or people are gonna get real scared of you bro people are stop gonna believe right Phil yeah just, yeah you wanna you wanna finish answering what you were gonna answer no yeah that, that that's just yeah that, I think that's the that's the simplest answer to us, right? Yeah, I think in, the, in this case, the simplest answer is the best. It's, it's frustrating talking to you because it's always the simplest answer to an unnecessarily complex complicated question. Yes, I was going to say frustrating that. Frustrating question. Yep. Yeah, right? it's like I just intellectually masturbated to make this question sound like it yeah. was worth something and he's just like that's all I know man Dude, we sit here and we're like what does Phil do and we're like trying to describe what it's like to be a camera right, right. all he says is capturing the validity of war right. and, and it's done like, okay. you know what that okay, makes it has everything that we talked about write a paper on that right it's like it's like enough to write five pages on that but Phil I wonder man because yeah. it's 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 the military as a career never appeared to me Ever, right? And so I've always wondered. And my first interaction with Milvets or people who've been part of something is as as intense as the military was when I arrived at Columbia. Yeah. Right? I've always wondered what could it have been that inspired people to put their lives at risk? And so some of it would have a few causes could be attributed to, to your own personal life. A few of them would have been things that you observed when you were you know, uh, a part of this this grand team, this grand gang, as you just said. Yeah. What are the what, what what really inspires people to do something like that? God and country. <laughs> <laughs> Freedom, as, brother. As soon as he says, Freedom. he starts laughing, and I'm like, okay, yeah, God and country. <laughs> Fuck yeah, I believe you there. Uh, I was I was in um, I was in the third grade when 9/11 happened, and it was moving watching a third grade teacher have to explain the word terrorism to a bunch of kids. I remember that very vividly. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, you know, at a very, very, there was just a culture in, in America where patriotism was so there. And it wasn't a bad thing. It was almost like an endless summer uh, f as a kid because, you know, we were America, right? Mm -hmm. um, when the reality of life sets in, um, you know, uh, growing up in like an impoverished, impoverished area, like that, that definitely that plays a factor. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't a good student in, in mm -hmm. high school, in school at all. I barely graduated, and um, you know, I always, I, I knew that. I always knew that the military was the one thing that I could do to help further my circumstance in life, not just for me, but so I could put my value back, my, my value and my worth back into the world. Mm -hmm. It was like a, a vessel, right, for, mm -hmm. for the plebeians, mm -hmm. like, you know. Uh, it, it was like this confluence of passion and reason to you, right, where mm -hmm. the reasonable choice was also stemming from this passionate urge to, to contribute back in, in memory of what you'd experienced as a third grader. Yes. Right? 
But what do you, you know what? Because I never realized a 9/11 was a huge deal to me, even in India. But oh, it, yeah, it was, it was just oh, never oh, as pivotal oh. as I hear people like Damien tell me, or 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 others who who lived through that experience, who were in New York for that experience. I remember the first time I was standing next to the memorial. Um, my tour guide, he was talking about it, and he he said how he used to work in the South Tower, uh, or Tower Two or something, yeah. and he was an architect. He had finished his project two days earlier than he was supposed to so he was taking a week long vacation oh, wow. and he remembered just like watching all his colleagues his entire life fucking destroyed live in front of his eyes right but uh, i was speaking with sushant and sushant was mentioning how he's probably making a film about the fact that this is the first election that the united states will have where it'll have voters who did not experience 911 what do you think about that how do you what do you think has how does that so we we see the change from a to b the mm-hmm. pivot that 911 was and now yeah. the fact that it's going to slowly go back to the recesses of history mm-hmm. right and that 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 transition is going to affect the future as we see it yeah. right what, what do you think about that do you think they they missed out <laughs> on an experience of life i, <laughs> I don't mean to uh, yeah. certainly but in the same breath they've gained mm-hmm. another uh donald trump is that what you mean <laughs> is that saying, another disaster the, 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 i think the effect to what you're saying there will, will certainly be less uh, uh, folks screaming America mm-hmm. uh, right uh, this, you know in the future I mean that's that was the like the overtly patriotic jignoistic almost would you say <laughs> what, what? Jigno, have you jignoistic this extreme form of nationalism that's yeah. like blinded that blinds everything else yeah it was a, it, it was a, like is that, am I using this word right a microcosm of 9-11 uh huh like it was just like it, it's you know it was a, it was a response and everything was like Lee, Lee Greenwood like you right. know, God bless the U.S. <laughs> like and you know it was just it was it was all that man uh, so yeah I, I think now that like this is going to be the first election that voters there'll be voters that didn't experience nine eleven I I think things might be a little more rational mm-hmm. might be a little more rational right you know who, who's to say I, I personally don't have the stomach for politics uh-huh. um, so you do need to gain weight <laughs> right yeah, 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 right. definitely uh-huh. gain a few political pounds right in the ring. <laughs> do you think the do you think the tilt is going to be Cause more what, liberal because what you were describing was when in political science they call it the rally around the flag effect mm. Right, so a tragedy occurs, yeah. and then the nation rallies around the flag, which is the the conception of the nation. Right, True. you become a, a unit, yeah, um, and that binds people together. Obviously, you don't want a terrorist attack to have, have to happen for that to occur. Mm-hmm. Um, but what people experience is something like euphoria sometimes. Yeah, right, where they have a common direction. Mm-hmm. Life has meaning. Everyone. Like the long summer, the way yeah. he put it was the long summer, which is, yeah. I was expecting something something to the effect of the long winter in the wake of something like that, but I see the sense in, in yeah. this in this feeling of collectiveness, this binding nature yeah. to it. Yeah, Tragedy true. has a binding nature Very to it, right? right? It. Yeah. Yeah. So the other end is that there's going to be a population now that's ignorant of what the, the tragedies that can occur in life, hmm. right? So they'll, Very true. So they'll vote according to that. But my, I think it's just interesting that you said that it would be a good thing because people would be more rational, right? Mm. Do you think, like, it's, one, it's necessary to have experienced some kind of, you know, like, ex- existential threat like that? Um, Otherwise, should... I think, I, I think, I'm so sorry, I wanted you to finish. But I think that's, it is, the current political environments, as far as I see here in America on college campuses, is that the meaning of tragedy has been trivialized. To an extent where it's yeah. where the mo- the the littlest things don't are like tragic. Yeah. Tragedy is a heavy word. You don't just throw it around, yeah, you know. Dude. So it could be indicative totally, of that because yeah. this batch of students that are now going through college were either one, two, or unborn or still in stomachs or probably coming out of the fucking urethra <laughs> at the point when <laughs> at the point the when kids are pissed out <laughs> sometimes <laughs> man that's what I used to think when I was growing up okay there's no sex ed in India you don't get it can I, uh, can I roll a joint during sure the yeah do you have your marijuana stack right here or do you want to go get it Is, do you have can I use your marijuana oh yeah yeah I mean I don't mind yeah go ahead I would have brought mine no 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 man you're my guest please feel hey, free hey, hey. 
feel free but do you think you think that's accurate like this this trivialization of concepts like tragedies and what not is a consequence of not really experiencing real tragedy you see it with the word violence right violence right. it's yeah. a perfect example you see people saying like i have been violenced upon mm-hmm. that is violence speaking this way mm-hmm. but when you experience actual violence you like none of that's irrelevant oh, it is the, the cobwebs fall thing. right yeah and it settles in something that's like wow this is what life is like mm-hmm. which is why i'm asking phil because i think it's interesting because i remember 9-11 and i remember yeah. what happened after that too right and i experienced it from like the being a brown person end mm-hmm. right which right. was my mom told me if they ask you say that you're not muslim mm-hmm. but remind them that muslims are not bad people uh-huh and that was a day of uh-huh. and i didn't know why the hell she was mentioning that mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. but even then like from what i experienced um people bound together for a common threat mm-hmm. right everyone looked like they had purpose in their eyes mm-hmm. and now all of a sudden it seems like it's what we talked about earlier right which is like your amygdala is going off we have, we have a sensitive generation because they are traumatized mm-hmm. right they have they're struggling with their own brains right so they're looking for threats and right. they can't find any real ones right. so they make them up everywhere they go Dude. right it, it's it, it's sort of telling of japan story post world war 2 as well like th- that that massive massive tragedy that occurred during world war 2 for japan it bound them together to create a society to create yeah, an society. innovative space to the extent where what 90% of the patents belong to japanese people yeah. man that is real cultivation of tragedy in some sense right yeah. and that's that's exactly why i've always tended to be um a little less than affected by this 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 blatant use of words like uh, violence and tragedy in in on the on campus at least is because i legit see what real tragedy social tragedy looks like every day as i walk the streets of india yeah. i see people who who know they have no future and they can do nothing about it imagine that helplessness yeah. you think this is tragic it's only the beginning you don't know how far south you go from there mm-hmm. right yeah. um phil i'm just insanely curious man and yeah. even though this this conversation is touching all sorts of philosophical nodes i want to ask you uh so, something more narrative oriented tell me in vivid detail what does a mission with the special forces look like hmm. so we uh wake up just as the sun's going down it, it, where the sun is already down we're on a different schedule it's, it's uh it's called like zulu time uh-huh. so it's like 4 hours behind the local time right and is it throughout no matter where you are on the planet Yeah, yeah, so the time has like, you know, the, it'll be like uh, I'm sure there's plenty of reasons for it, but we we, you know, we're waking up as the sun's going down and the sun's already down and uh we, you know, gather in the 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 the, the mission area and have a briefing and we figure out if we're going to, you know, go after one of these fucking bad guys. Mm-hmm. So, um after the briefing, if, you know, we have enough and tell the fucking you know, validate the Thread. mission right then um we'll start preparing and what does those pre- what do those preparations look like like what do you do do you set up defenses do you set up <laughs> radius um some guys go to the gym before mission really definitely definitely want to eat some guys might like lay up in the rack and beat their pud some oh. guys might play video games or I think Game of Thrones just came out. Ah. Right? So they might have been catching up on like episode 3 of like Game of Thrones. Right. Uh but yeah, you know, mostly it's spent like in the the talk, like the the command set, like area and you're, you know, just prepping and tell doing whatever you have to do specifically for your job. For me, I, you know, check my equipment, like my the batteries in my camera, my card, my my, my weapon, like everything's fucking Gucci. Um and then we have like a manifest time and then we, we a manifest time yeah yeah like we're like final manifest call like where like the rosters are called out for the two chalks like the helicopters that we're going out on uh uh-huh. like chalk one and then like the like yaw like a list of names and like you just like yell like sergeant like after like they yell yours and then you right. get, you get you know in your chalk line and then you you get in the, the fucking helicopters and you slowly see the lights of the civilization the camp that you're at like so we disappear behind disappear you behind you yeah. right and um and then you descend somewhere 
Yeah, and then we either like, and then we yeah we, we go after the target we're we're after, and th this can be done like by various methods. Mm -hmm. um, the most lively, interesting, and exciting is like a um, an X landing where you where you're landing like right on like the target. So mm -hmm. like you're literally like within a hundred meters of the like the compound you're getting ready to hit. Right. So they obviously know you're coming for a while because American helicopters aren't quiet. Uh -huh. <laughs> what helicopters are quiet at all? None. None, and right? These are CH-47s that are double rotary too, so they're, you can hear us coming from miles away. Right. They, they, call, it, they call us green-eyed demons that uh -huh. ride in on dragons. Because uh -huh. um, all you can see is the light from the uh, night vision on, against the eyes. Um, right. And those things are so loud. So that's like the most exciting. Like you get off, and like the odds are that you're probably getting shot at. Like as you're descending, as you're approaching, you'd yeah. probably be shot at. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a much higher chance. Yeah, of course. You're unprepared. You're almost vulnerable, right? Yeah, yeah. But the, also, like you're catching them with their pants down because we have like sixty guys. We're about to like wrap these guys up. I mean, mm -hmm. things can go wrong. But mm -hmm. or you have like another like uh, type of info where you land about like five k, ten k away. And you walk to the target, um, right under like night vision, and those are fun too. They also suck to some extent because you're like navigating the terrain. Uh huh. And like during that whole time, like I'm, um, like I, I sort of like I if if you're good at what you do, they'll trust you enough to, to be on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, and fortunately, my guys trusted me, and they let me just sort of roam wherever they because they knew I could do my job and right. they saw the badass pictures that I took and they're like oh sweet so like once they know you can do it like, yeah, yeah. And, and you're also like not in the, the fucking way and like being a distractor like, you know just doing anything you shouldn't be doing right um, so like during that whole time like I'm like sort of like running around like like just getting like I'm looking around at the, like, the landscape trying to like figure out like where I can run to and put my camera down and click my shutter and try and capture like long exposure shot or you know I might have like my night vision lens on and like recording some videos of us walking to the target and so how long is this how, an average operation like four hours five hours I would say less yeah, definitely less than that uh -huh. it, it would depend uh, but they're usually like two to three two to three like, hours of immediate existential threat <laughs> from right the time we like we're wheels up leaving the camp until the time we get back uh, that can be anywhere from two to I would say two to four hours usually. Mm -hmm. Sometimes like you might have like a follow on mission, so you might stay until the daytime. Right. That gets a lot more dangerous, obviously, because you don't have like the blanket of nighttime. Right. Um, that so only, that only happened once. Though. So you descend, and then the shooting begins, and it's just it's just it's just flashes of light in the darkness. Not always. Like it. Sometimes it's it's uh, it's much more. It's handled in much more like. Politely, yeah, to so some degree, right? right? Like, we, we definitely. Like, we have like a call out. Like sometimes, like when sometimes we, we don't always get into like a gunfight when we go out. Um, sometimes you just use your bazooka launcher to just blast the fuck out of them. It's much more political these days. Uh -huh. Like we'll like show up and it's actually we, we would do this thing called like a call out where like like the the Afghan like interpreters like get over the loudspeaker like Talaju Talaju like like come out. This is like American U.S. coalition forces. You're surrounded, like, uh -huh. and uh, sometimes, like, the gunfighting would start after that. Ooh. Um, mm. Which, that gets a little... Intense. Yeah, sticky. Uh, but sometimes it was just, like, you know, like, they, they were just, we'd catch them with their pants down. They had no chance of fighting. But and, sometimes, I'm assuming, there is a lot of bloodshed and a lot of loss of life and a lot of tragedy that occurs in that moment as well, right? I, I mean, there's definitely, there's... Because not all missions I see would go north always, right? There would be there would be an, a, a huge set of things. Because, you know, when I imagine when I imagine conflict with firepower, it's like no matter what the degree of your firepower is, unpredictability takes precedence over anything else. The the, the random odd that a flying bullet from I don't know my friend itself, my my teammate might hit me, right? And the best guess I have towards that is I don't know laser tag, paintball. You know, like I'm I'm just trying to extrapolate. It's it's a you can be just absolutely exposed and just be caught unaware, right? As much as 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 the people who are pants down, quite literally, uh, might be. Yeah. 
So I'm assuming you experienced a lot of bloodshed and carnage, or were you just I mean not sweetly me. away from that experience? Definitely not so sweetly away. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But not. I would say that the blood and carnage was not on our end. We were the one that the ones that were inflicting the blood and carnage. Yeah, but even still. Yeah. I mean, I would assume you were. Otherwise, I wouldn't have this con. I wouldn't be having this conversation with you. You'd probably be buried under a gravestone somewhere, right? If you were being. Yeah. If it you was were like losing. We, we were the ones that were definitely. Like, it, I experienced it, uh, but not in a sentimental way, as if you were like one of like my my fellow guys. Right. But seeing all those dead bodies and all that blood splattered around, even after the mission's done, and even if the blood's, the enemy's blood, it's still red in color and it still invokes the same human sentiment as anything else. And the smell is what's And the worse. smell, it's yeah. Worse. And the smell. Those fuckers smell bad when they're alive. They smell even worse when they're dead. Hey, man, you're almost talking about my people at this point. It's kind of offensive. <laughs> <laughs> no, but on a serious note, though, Phil, what, what is all that carnage and all that bloodshed that you observe teach you? Mm. Um... <laughs> That nothing in just how fragile life is. Like I, I think, that, like you can't help but in those moments when you see like some dude's dilapidated face, like understand that we're we're just we're we're just like vessels of energy traversing time and space, right? Uh huh. And those vessels can be very easily splintered, right? Internally and externally, right? Uh, Either by somebody else or our own accord, you know, like it's it's right. very real. Like you understand those moments that like what really matters is. It's like if I were to look myself in the mirror and be and come to face with not myself but the fragile mortality that I carry within. What would that teach me? It, right. Yeah. Oh, it, there, it teaches. There's like there's there's. Maybe that's where the gratitude in you comes yeah. from. Oh, it's certainly these these there there are moments where. I get, like what I what I say the other day it made you guys laugh that I made peace with God in the back of a CH forty seven. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it made you laugh. Like yeah, those moments like they make you understand the transity of life. That mm-hmm. like like just there's like this brief brief like moment when you think you're you're gonna die. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're sure you're gonna die. Um, where you you just let go of everything and like. It's just like a good meditation session. That stillness stays with you uh, as much as you allow it to, you know. And I think those certainly like the the, the moments of trauma, in some sense, that make you, you know, see the impermanence of life for what it is. Yeah, they they definitely they help you understand uh, how how important gratitude is right to all things you know do you find yourself feeling lucky for being alive after having been through everything that you have mm-hmm. or what, what, did you always assume that was an obvious outcome of your endeavor mm. I never like I never thought I was going to die when I was I mean there, there were definitely times but like going there I never thought like oh, I might not come back like mm-hmm. in my mind I was always just like view the shit I'm here to go do a job mm-hmm. I'm going to do it I'm going to try to fucking do it well. right pretty damn well I think you did and then you know I'm gonna come back and then and I'm gonna continue on so it was right. just like this was like another step that I was that I was taking in life um, but they, then there were moments like where I was just I, there was you know moments where I was like okay this is it like uh-huh. um, and you <laughs> you just yeah, I mean, you just let go and you accept everything because nothing and life matters to you at that point because you think you're going to die mm-hmm. so it's just like everything is just it's just released and you just like when you when, like when you're like forced to just let go like that um, you know what I think I'm so sorry no, no, I thought no, you were yeah there's just like there's uh, this the stillness that you talk about this meditation yeah um, it's you know, every every person that I've been interviewing, or at least the men that I interview, I initially start talking about sports because I, I find that to be an integral part of most men that I've interviewed. Up until. <coughs> but then there is also, also this aspect, and I think it's abundantly clear in the military more so than any other endeavor that you might engage in, mm-hmm. which is this, this stillness, this meditation that you refer to. 
it's like this uh, it's like this weird flow state that you are inevitably bound for because you surrender in discipline this this weird commissure of surrender and discipline which at least to my rational mind are the polar opposites of each other right mm-hmm. uh, uh, as soon as they blend in with the, all the training and the discipline inducted into you uh, over the years of being part of the military and the surrender that you have to mm-hmm. the letting go that you you have to make peace with god at the back of a ch47 right yeah. like that that would probably put you in 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 an alpha state in a, in a state that you probably never forget because this this sense of residue is also something i that people from a military background resonate to me mm-hmm. that they always just remember that that it's it's so very difficult to forget that phase of your life i was here described as something um incredibly fortunate that occurred to them because it's rare that you're sitting comfortably with your own mortality so reconciled true. with so true you're never exposed to that in real life it's like the ledger's <clears throat> closed right yeah you're no longer carrying it for an eventual death that's when i when i talk to my friends and they're thankful or they're apologizing i'm like hold on to your ledgers we'll settle it at death that's, you don't have any that's so true like it's like you realize at that moment that nothing in life is about death until the moment it happens mm-hmm. like nothing in life like so why why spend time thinking and like dreading obviously we're going to think about it it's in our nature it's unavoidable right. but dreading uh, like ourselves to the point of like resistance and aversion uh, over it is like yeah that's what it helps you sort of understand like the that it's just damn I just hit this joint until I lost it <laughs> you know what that reminds me of though uh, we were having a conversation um, very recently actually. unique <laughs> just like, very special dude let me, special. Some, let me gain some insight real quick <laughs> so we were having a we were having a conversation about death recently right yeah 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 and um wow now I'm about to forget I can, <laughs> I can, I can feel, feel myself like, forgetting uh, yes to forget. <laughs> you know my mother listens to all of this she's gonna be so pissed at uh, all of you guys auntie sa sirika uh, <laughs> jigunu bolna <laughs> jigunu bolna hey um okay so what we were saying was um I so I recently lost somebody in my life and we were talking about how your experience when you lost your dad. Yes. And um I was thinking that uh it was interesting that there's a unique gift that the departed give us, Truly. right? Which is sobriety, mm-hmm. which is for for some reason a small like fleeting sense of sovereignty, right? Yeah. All the other yeah. nonsensical parts of life die away. Mm-hmm. The cobwebs fall. And and all you're left with mm-hmm. is what you actually care about mm-hmm. right what actually matters to you yeah and i hear a lot of people in the military describe that as a, as like one of the most fortunate aspects of the military yeah. weirdly right because you wouldn't think so mm-hmm. but they describe it as something uh profound that occurred to them and they're for, they're grateful to it and yeah. they're like almost like in debt sublime. to it yeah right very sublime right to move away from um all this as much as i'm having fun discussing sure. death and tragedy and war um How does Phil fill up his free time in his second adult life as a student? That is such a good question. That is wow. Oh my god. I, I think that's that. an iambic, iambic pentameter too. How does Phil fill up his life in his second, second adult life? life. F- fill up his time as his <gasps> in his second Wait. adult life as a student. That yeah, uh, yeah. Borrow that phrase. It's yours oh, now. Oh man. That's 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 the experience I'm having, man. really is like a second childhood because I you, I feel like you, I grew up twice I grew up in life and then I grew up in the army uh-huh. and um you know going straight from high school like literally like I left basic for basic training 20 days after like my birthday my 18th birthday and then going into you know this sort of institution like the US army um you know gave me I think the necessary tools of discipline to to live this second childhood So how do I fill up my free my free time and do you read poetry books do you watch films do you write what do you what do you do with your free time now man I uh, my free time How are you still expressing the poetry within Dude that's that's what it is like in my free time I'm 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 on a, a journey of like this discovery almost like always like I am trying to cultivate some further understanding of myself through the through the structure of art. Uh-huh. So a lot of that is is not like glorious. Um a lot of it is like the very um unflattering parts of being an artist like the very like 
Um, I'm just the uh, I don't fill in my free time. Yeah, my poetry. I I try to figure out how I'm going to be the greatest storyteller of my generation. That's constantly on my mind. Man. Is that is that how is that the same dream you see yourself pursuing 10 years from now is that how phil's life look like looks like this constant treadmill to approximate this distinction of being the greatest storyteller of his generation yeah but it's not a treadmill it's it's just a it's a it's a it's a marathon it's a climb it's a climb mm-hmm. huh yeah i see yeah it. and like when i say like i want to be the greatest storyteller of my generation there's there's by no means what i mean like I want that for the notion of being the greatest. Mm-hmm. I want to live in the hearts of as many people as I can, and by a result of that, it will equivocate to me being one of the greatest to do it. But the, the, the measure that I'm seeking is living in the hearts of other people mm-hmm. through the stories that I tell. Mm-hmm. And you know, by result, like that's something that people would consider great. Mm-hmm. Right. I have a I have a question that I ask people uh, often. It's it's one of the pre-prepared questions that let lets me investigate the person behind the face, right? And and I'm not sure if it entirely applies to you because you're a unique individual. That question is, what is a prerequisite virtue in someone you love? But I kind of have a feeling that you really don't have a filter when it comes to eliciting love. But do you have a prerequisite when you look at somebody, when you say you look at Perry, you're like, that is why I fucking love you, man. What is that, that? What is what is that, question mark? Oh, man. Uh, if, the per- if that person simply has an essence of themselves, you know, like what fascinates and draws me to you guys is the fact that you, you're, you're your own person. You're something... Cause Many people try to fit into like a convention or an idea of what they should, the way they want to be, right? And then you're never really like figuring out who you are, you know? Uh, but you guys, what what that thing is, is just quite simply the fact that you have an essence. There's something about you that makes you stand out in the backdrop of people that are trying to... Conform. To yeah, you. to be something they're not. They're mm-hmm. seeking what ought to be instead of what actually is. So it's the authenticity that draws you yeah, to people, true. right? The, the the courage that it takes to be yourself, mm, right? Yes, right? Yeah, yeah mm. I think that's like, I think that's, if not the most, one of the most beautiful, one of the most pure ways to be connected to somebody is because the fact that you recognize no matter how different they are from you, they're their own person. And because they're that thing, their own person, they have something that, of value and something to, to, to offer you and you have something to offer them and mm-hmm. that exchange is like just such a brilliant backing to like a like that exchange is the golden ratio yeah it's like the healthy healthiness of a relationship i'm know? borrowing your terminology <laughs> here i'm just trying to say, think what phil might say um phil what is one thing that you were absolutely glad columbia gave you mm. and don't say Thank us you. please man because i know you attempted to <laughs> <laughs> Um, he's saying, please say Prucker. No, 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 man. Honestly, what is one thing that you are glad, Columbia? What is the one change that you've seen within yourself since you've been at Columbia? It's, there's so many, man. Like, if not for this place, like, I I don't know where my life would be because of the things that I've experienced, you know, why, why I've been here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this place has been like a home, uh, a real community. I mean, the, the, it's the people that make the place, no matter where you go. And it's certainly here. It's it's a it's a it's a, um it's important, like the professors, the knowledge. Um, but it's the I think overall, man. It's like it's the chance, you know. It was a chance that. That I was was given to come here is what I'm most grateful for. Um, I guess, once again, this weed is really... <laughs> <laughs> Phil! Um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. As a Go GS ahead. student. Um, Do you think GS is trash? Yes. <laughs> well, more so, this uh, sense of gratitude you have for coming here. Yeah. Is it more of a gratitude, not necessarily for here, but a, a gratitude to, to start again 
Yeah. Because <clears throat> I know that, because I had the traditional um, American upbringing, right? So That's a very good mm-hmm. point. High school and then college. And college was this ordeal that you had to succeed at. Mm-hmm. But GS students that came here, a lot of them have the same story of that we just, we really fucked up in high school in some way. Mm-hmm. We didn't do our best, at least. And then in college, we know we didn't do our best, but we still did deviated in some way. Yeah. And then life took its course. And then for some reason, we decided that, hey, you know what? This education is worth it. Let's try yeah. again. Yeah. Right. Is it the redemption in that? Maybe redemption or more so like that second chance there. Yeah. Yeah. So I've always been like a, a seeker of truth, man, and knowledge. It's, it's what it's like where my bliss is in life. Whenever when you subtract everything else in life, what what's important to me is is um, the pursuit of, of knowledge and and sharing that you know like and sharing it with others to, to, to positively benefit our you know our lives collectively mm-hmm. I, have, I just have this very humanitarian um, view on things man like I I feel like I've I've never I'm I'm most articulate when I'm when I'm grateful, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel like there's just so much to be earned when trying to give uh, back in some way. Mm-hmm. That um, you know, yeah, this this place was really that uh, that shot to to seek that knowledge and, mm-hmm. and further cultivate it in a way that can be used in my stories to help people understand themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, me putting something out there and saying, "Have you ever felt this way? Mm-hmm. Is this something that uh, you know makes you feel a little less alone in this world?" Mm-hmm. Yeah, this place has been my landscape of discovery for like the great communication or like the great, <laughs> the great conversation that that's being had mm-hmm. throughout history, like the greatest thinkers, and, right, uh, and poets and artists. Um, it's like a citadel mm-hmm. dude without without being um without making a value judgment on all the other interviews that i've had up until i think this has been damn absolutely a hundred percent my favorite one talking to you is is really an experience it's 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 no longer just communication it's no longer just conversation it becomes an experience mm. thank you for thank fucking you, delving into the details of your life as poetically as it was um, we've been at it for an hour. I don't know if any of you noticed. Ooh, that's a tight but hour. But it's been phenomenal, dude. Thank it's you, been phenomenal. Brother. Thank you so Ooh. much, man. Woo! Give it up for our guest star. <laughs> oh, yeah, that too.